So thank you very much for this uh, invitation to speak about primary uh, refractory young uh, myeloma patients. Um, so I'm Dr. Salomon Manier, I'm a medical doctor from uh, Lille in, in France. So we will start with this uh, clinical case of a 46 years old lady. She has just a medical history of thyroidectomy due to a multinodular goiter. And she was diagnosed in 2009 with an uh, IgG lambda MGAS. Uh, she was at that time followed in another uh, center and, and referred to us uh, in December 2017 when she was diagnosed with a multiple myeloma. Uh, so she was ISS1 or ISS2. She had a del 17 that we could observe in 80% uh, of the cells uh, in, by fish. Um, she had two crab or slim crab, slim crab criteria uh, that were the bone lesions and 68% uh, of uh, bone marrow plasma cells uh, uh, on the bone marrow smears. Um, she received a kyphoplasty of T5, as you can see on the on the right uh, picture, she had these uh, uh, bo body uh, T5 lesions that was at risk of fracture, and, and she received a, a kyphoplasty on that, on that bone lesion. Uh, the plan was to treat her um, front line with a four cycle of VRD as induction, then do an autograph transplantation, possibly two autograph transplantation because, because she has this high risk uh, cytogenetic uh, feature with the DAL17P and then do uh, consolidation with RVD and, and lenalidomide as a maintenance. So we started the, the VRD in, in January uh, 2018, and, and this is uh, what happened after. So she received the fourth, first cycle uh, as induction of VRD, uh, and you can see that she barely uh, went from three gram per deciliter of uh, m spike to 2.5, basically at the end of uh, the four uh, induction regimens. So um, uh, basically she didn't achieve it a partial response. She was in stable disease at that stage. So we decided to, to switch her uh, induction regimen to uh, DPACE. And she received basically two DPACE before going to autograft transplantation. The autograft transplantation was able to uh, put the patient in pas a partial response um, after a CT. And we actually uh, then simply monitor the patient basically because she didn't have a good uh, hematological recovery, as you can see on the platelet scones here in, in green. Um, and we, we couldn't uh, uh, treat more the patients with a maintenance regimen, so we uh, followed her carefully and she and she's still uh, doing fine. We are now at uh, about 18 months, close to 20, 24 months of the autograph transplantation. So we wanted to start with this clinical case to discuss some um, aspects of these primary refractory patients for the prognosis, uh, what we know about this prognosis. Uh, what is the incidence now with newer uh, induction regimens and, and how can we manage them? What do we have in, in the literature to help them, uh, to help us uh, managing these patients? So first, the, the definition of a primary refractory young myeloma patients are these patients who do not achieve at least a partial uh, remission after an induction uh, regimen. So meaning that they are only achieve a stable disease or a progressive disease as per uh, IMWG uh, criteria. Uh, so what do we know about the prognosis? Uh, this is a retrospective study of the, of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they study 609 patients who received an induction with PI and or uh, IMID. Uh, it, the period time was from 2006 to 2015, and they observed in this cohort 15% of patients with a primary uh, refractoriness. Um, as you can see in the multivariable analysis, 
On these uh, 609 patients, the prognostic factors that were significantly impacting the outcome of these patients were the age, older than 65 years old, and this uh, primary refractoriness. And as expected, the outcome was uh, worse for uh, these uh, patients with a primary refractory disease and the median OS was 3.6 years versus almost seven, uh, eight years for uh, primary responders. So the next question was, what, what incidence um, uh, can we observe with newer uh, induction regimens? So for that, we took a, um, a kind of history of induction regimens uh, with uh, VAD and then uh, thalidomide, the dexamethasone, the velcate dex, uh, VTD, VRD, and the, and the KRD. I extracted data from uh, different uh, phase three uh, studies <clears throat> and um, did plot the uh, percentage of patients with standard uh, stable disease or progressive disease after at least four cycles of uh, induction. As you can see, uh, with uh, the old VAD, 48% of patients didn't achieve a partial response uh, after the induction. With thalidomide and dexamethasone, it was 24. It goes to 19% with velcate dex and went to 12% with VTD. It's 6% in uh, VRD and for KRD in the 40 study, uh, it was reported to be 4% of the patients who didn't achieve um, a partial uh, response. So how can we manage uh, uh, this patient and should we improve the, the response before or, or after uh, the autograph transplantation? So the first thing is, uh, autograph transplantation seems to be a good salvage uh, therapy. Uh, this is a study from the British Society for Blood and Marrow Transplantation. They took 126 patients uh, who achieved less than a partial response after induction and went to um, uh, autograph transplantation. They observed 86% of overall response rate after uh, autograph transplantation, 24% of them were in complete remission and the median PFS was uh, 18 months, while the median overall survival was 51 months in this, uh, in this cohort. What was interesting as well is to see the, the uh, statistically significant different prognosis of patients who in, in the cohort of the refractory, primary refractory patients, the one who uh, were in minimal response or stable disease as compared to the one in progressive disease who had a worse outcome uh, in terms of PFS or OS. So can we uh, improve the response before autograph transportation and do does it benefit to the patient to improve uh, before uh, going to the uh, ACT? So this is a study from the International Blood and Marrow Transplantation Research uh, that retrospectively studied 539 patients who achieved less than a partial response after uh, induction and uh, underwent uh, autograph transplantation. But for 215 of them, they went directly to uh, autograph transplantation. It's the no salvage uh, uh, group. And for 324 of them, they received an additional chemotherapy as salvage uh, before proceeding to the, uh, the autograph transplantation. So this is the salvage uh, group. And as you can see, the uh, complete remission um, uh, rate was higher in the salvage group with 19% achieving a um, complete remission, while only 9% uh, did achieve a complete remission uh, in the no salvage group. However, there was no difference in terms of PFS uh, with a four-year uh, PFS of 21% for no salvage versus 30% for salvage and as well for the overall survival with a four-year overall survival of 66% in the salvage versus 59% uh, with no salvage. So there is no evidence that uh, uh, salvage therapy before going to uh, autograph transplantations is uh, really beneficial for a patient. But in any way, we can think of this problem as you do an induction regimen, the patients are 
primary uh, refractory that don't achieve at least a PR, you have two options. Either you do a salvage therapy before autograft transplantation, or you do directly the autograft transplantation, but anyway, you will have to likely switch the treatments after autograft transplantation because if they didn't respond to this induction regimen, likely you, you won't treat them um, in the same way after the autograft transplantation for either consolidation or maintenance. Uh, the consolidation could also be a second uh, autograft transplantation in these uh, high-risk patients if they had a good response and, and a good therapy autograft transplantation. Uh, so we don't have guidelines here, but anyway, this um, uh, discussion about switching the therapy as compared to the induction regimen for either salvage or maintenance or consolidation and maintenance uh, will happen in these in this patients before or after the autograph transplantation. And in that situation, uh, it, seems, it seems clear that there is a, likely a place for these new therapies and, and especially the new immunotherapies with the CAR T cell and the bispecific, uh, we can think if indicated clinical trials for these patients, it, uh, it represents a small number of patients uh, because it's about 5% of the uh, transplant eligible patients with, new, with newer uh, induction regimens. So, but we, we can think that uh, future clinical trials can have a specific arm for patients who didn't achieve at least a partial remission after uh, induction regimens. So in conclusion, uh, we uh, show that primary refractory patients represent about 5% of the patients with uh, newer induction regimens and who are um, uh, undergoing uh, autograph transplantations. It's, of course, associated with an adverse outcome, especially for the patients who are progressive uh, after the induction regimens. They are a high-risk group of patients that we should consider um, as, as, as it. And, and we have a lack of evidence so far regarding the benefits of salvage therapy uh, before the autograph transplantations, the question of the place of new agents such uh, CAR T cells or bispecific antibodies, uh, is still open and, and probably that we need further uh, clinical trials to, to answer the questions. So with this, I'd like to thank you very much and, and hopefully we can, we can further discuss this uh, all together in a, in a near future. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Paula Rodriguez. I am a hematologist and I work at the University of Navarra. Uh, first and foremost, I hope and wish that you and your loved ones are staying safe in these complicated times. Uh, second, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and also for the hard work that they are doing to settle this uh, virtual meeting. So my task today is to discuss frontline therapy in a newly diagnosed elderly myeloma patient requiring dialysis. So these are my disclosures. So let's start with a clinical case. So this is a 71-year-old woman with a prior history of a colon adenocarcinoma that was diagnosed in 2006 and treated with surgery. Since then, the patient is in complete remission. And also this patient has an eye hypertension that is treated with ACE inhibitors with a good control. So the patient came to our institution complaining about a decline in the general condition and a decrease in the urine output in the last few days, and also chim and numbness. So in the lab test that you can see here in this slide, there is a, a moderate anemia with an hemoglobin of 8.2 grams deciliter, a mild thrombocytopenia and leukopenia, hypercalcemia with a corrected calcium of 12 milligrams per deciliter, acute kidney injury with a creatinine levels of 9.8 with a creatinine clearance of less than 10 milli, 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 milliliters per minute, hyperkalemia, and also high levels of beta-2 microglobulins and an S-spike in the S uh, M spike in the serum of 31 grams per liter that was identified as an AGG kappa, and also a significant amount of um, kappa light chain spence Jones proteinuria of 7 grams in 24-hour collected urine. 
Also, serum for the chain kappa was significantly high with 70,000 milligrams per liter. So with a, a suspicion of myeloma and acute kidney injury related to a cast nephropathy, a, we perform a bone marrow aspiration that show a, 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 a significant infiltration of a clonal plasma cells with 75% in the bone marrow, 50% a, a, a detected by flow cytometry or clonal and aberrant plasma cells with kappa restriction and fish analysis in a plasma cell is, it was negative. So we perform a whole body low dosity scan that show lipid lesions all over the body and one in the left jaw of the patient. I remind you that the patient was complaining about a gene paresthesias. So we decided to perform an MRI that uh, revealed a bone plasma cytoma in the left jaw as you can see in the left-hand side of the slide. So in conclusion, this is a 71-year-old woman with an IgG kappa multiple myeloma, ISS3 because of the elevated beta-2 microglobulin, revised ISS2 because fish and LDH were both normal, with a bone plasma, plasma cytoma in the jaw, a standard risk fish, an acute kidney injury due to cast nephropathy that was an akin stage three, referral stage of FA. So here in this slide, you can find the recommended classification for acute kidney injury. So we can use either the referral staging or the akin definition. And this is what we need to use, and it's also used by nephrologists to all of us speak the same language when we are speaking about acute kidney injury. So in our patient, the stage was three, and this patient was indeed requiring a renal replacement therapy. Regarding some numbers, so prevalence of renal failure in multiple myeloma patients, approximately 50% of myeloma patients may have some degree of renal impairment at presentation. Some of them, 20%, uh, may have acute kidney injury in different degrees. But fortunately, a small proportion of those patients will require long term dialysis. And this is ranging between one. Uh, up to 5% of myeloma patients. So myeloma-related renal failure is associated with an increased risk of infection and also an increased uh, risk of early death. Focusing on acute kidney injury, it can be of different origins. So it can be of pre-renal uh, mechanism due to reduced perfusion, such as, for example, in the case of a patient with dehydration because of diarrhea, for example, and it can also be related to a post-renal origin, for example, due to a, a obstructive uropathy in the context of, a, for example, a pelvic ec extramedullary mass. But in the majority of the patients, the damage is intrinsic and can be either in the glomeruli space, so this is typically the case for a amyloidosis, for amyloid deposition, and also is the case for light change deposition diseases, or can be a tubular interstitial damage. And this is typically the case for the cast and nephropathy that we are going to focus on. So in the next slide, you can see a beautiful cartoon explaining the different mechanisms of kidney damage related to multiple myeloma. And we are focusing uh, down there or in cast nephropathy, as you all probably know, a, a light chains that are filtered in the glomeruli go through the tubuli and they bind in an acid milieu to tampor cell proteins, and this forms insoluble casts. Uh, this cast will obstruct the tubular lumen and also will increase or put in place inflammatory phenomenon in the, in the tubuli that will lead ultimately to acute kidney injury. Diagnosis of myeloma-related renal impairment can be easily performed using a um, evaluation of the 24-hour 
collected urine and doing electrophoresis and immunofixation. So if the patient has proteinuria, which consists mainly of free light chains, as you can see here in the right-hand side of the slide, so the, um, the diagnosis will be likely be a CAS nephropathy. So in these cases, a renal biopsy is probably not necessary, but we need to take into account that renal impairment in myeloma patients may be multifactorial. These patients are elderly, sometimes had hypertension, diabetes, or other comorbidities. So in some patients, renal biopsy will be of help to rule out other conditions that may play a role in the kidney injury of the patient. On the other hand, as you can see in the left-hand side of the slide, if the patient has non-selective proteinuria or significant albuminuria, a less amount of free light chains. So then we need to think about damage at the glomeruli. And this is the case, for example, for amyloidosis or light deposition disease or other conditions such as, for example, glomerulonephritis. So in this case, renal biopsy is often needed to clarify the diagnosis. So as I mentioned before, renal insufficiency is associated with adverse outcome in myeloma patients. It has an impact in the infection risk that is higher in these patients. They have also a higher uh, incidence of early death and also a decrease in overall survival. And this is true even after recovery of the renal function, as you can see here in the graphs in the left-hand side of the slide. So let's go back to our clinical case, to our 61-year-old woman, woman. And as you can see here, so uh, we started, so this was a patient that required renal replacement therapy, and we started at the beginning using high, uh, high cut uh, uh, output dialysis membranes. Also, we started antimyeloma therapy with bortezomib plus high-dose dexamethasone, and uh, initial evolution was good. So patient uh, hematological response was uh, good and rapid, and hypercalcemia was managed with calcitonin, but unfortunately, renal recovery uh, was uh, not present, and this patient is indeed uh, requiring uh, also today uh, uh, dialysis. Okay, so what about management of multiple myeloma-related acute kidney injury? So first and foremost, a, a rapid diagnosis and an immediate start of myeloma therapy uh, is very important, uh, and this is critical uh, for uh, to achieve a good renal recovery. Uh, so this should be, of course, accompanied by, by, by an adequate supportive care that should contain adequate hydration with fluids, uh, control of fluid balance, uh, important to avoid other nephrotoxic drugs. And this is especially the case when we are thinking about performing a um, contrast enhanced imaging techniques. So we need to be careful with this. Uh, urine alkalinization, I put there a question mark because uh, the role is controversial. So I personally do like urine alkalinization, but it needs to be uh, evaluated in the context of the patient. Uh, it is also important to manage rapidly other complications that may uh, further impair renal function, such as, for example, infections or hypercalcemia. When managing hypercalcemia, we need to avoid bifosphonates because they are a nephrotoxic drugs and we may uh, privilege the use of calcitonin or denosumab. And also it is important to, to think that furosemate uh, should be used with caution. It's generally not recommended because it, it increased the acid pH at the tubuli uh, milieu and this increased the cast formation. So we need to be a, um, a use it with a caution. So concerning the use of mechanical methods to remove the excess of uh, light chains, in the last year, some conflicting results have been published regarding the use of high output dialysis membranes. So initial reports suggested uh, an increased efficacy compared to conventional filters. 
Uh, but two recent phase two randomized trials, so the ULIGHT and the MIRE trial, uh, failed to demonstrate a, a benefit in the use of these uh, high output uh, membranes. So these two trials include a newly diagnosed myeloma patients requiring dialysis due to a myeloma-related uh, renal disease, cast nephropathy. Uh, all the patients receive induction treatment with protethomy-based therapy, so PAT in the ULIGHT trial and VD in the MIRE study group. And in both the studies, the primary objective was hemodialysis independence of three months. As, as you can see in the slides, so a uh, rates of hemodialysis independence was similar in both groups. And in the case of the ULIGHT trial, even overall survival was uh, lower for the experimental arm. So in conclusion, today, we, no formal recommendation can be made in regards to the use of these high output filters uh, for a cast uh, nephropathy in patients. What about myeloma therapy? So few reports have focused uh, in dialysis uh, in patients requiring dialysis. So the larger experience is this one that has been published in 2017 by uh, the Greek group, by Dimopoulos. Uh, in this uh, single center experience, they analyzed 52 patients uh, that were had newly diagnosed my myeloma and end-stage renal disease due to cast nephropathy. 82% uh, of the patients receive bortezomib based therapies, generally triplets with VCD or VTD. And this is the responses. So renal responses uh, happened in 50% of the patients. It was higher the percentage of renal responders for those patients receiving triplet bortezomib combinations. Dialysis independence for bortezomib treated patients was 49%. And myeloma responses, you can see there in the slide, an overall response rate of 64% with PEPR or better rate of 38%. Important, achieving PR in the first two months was associated with a higher a probability of renal responses and those patients that responded and were able to discontinue dialysis uh, benefit from a larger median overall survival, 47 months versus 21%. The early mortality rate in this uh, study was 16%. And in the survival curve, they did perform a landmark analysis after the first two months where all the early mortality uh, was accumulated. <clears throat> so the conclusion of this uh, paper is that myeloma patients with acute kidney injury requiring dialysis, a, a rapid response is a, a, a rapid myeloma response is needed and is associated with a high probability of renal recovery and independence from dialysis. And again, bortezomib-based uh, therapies and especially triplets remain the standard of care. So now we are going to review a little bit the data that we have with the different antimyeloma drugs. We are going to start with the bortezomib inhibitor-based therapy. So as um, already discussed, bortezomib, so the first generation PI, uh, is remains the cornerstone of a uh, myeloma treatment in patients with renal uh, impairment. Uh, it's able to induce a quick response, which is very important for renal recovery. Also important, so no, those adjustments are required, so we can keep the same schedule and the same dose. If the patient is an, in dialysis, bortezomib will be given after the dialysis. So it needs to be combined with high-dose dose, high dose dex, especially for the first uh, cycles and ideally with a third drug that could be, for example, cyclophosphamide, which is safe and non-nephrotoxic, and this increases uh, the efficacy of the regimen. With this uh, drug, overall response rate is around 80%, this comparable with uh, that of patients without renal impairment. 
and major renal responses uh, can happen between 40 and 87 percent, uh, percent of the patients. So important drug for the treatment of acute kidney injury related to myeloma. What about second generation proteasome inhibitors? So carfilzomib is also safe. No dose modifications are needed. It can be used even in dialysis dependent patients and efficacy is uh, roughly maintained. Uh, Excessomib, so the oral PI needs a, a dose modification. So the starting dose will be three milligrams instead of four for those patients with end stage renal disease or dialysis. Uh, and a similar safety profile uh, and efficacy is also maintained. What about init based therapy? So thalidomide is safe does not require dose modifications, but is not very well tolerated in elderly patients. Lenalidomide, on the other hand, does require dose modifications. So for patients with end-stage renal disease or for those patients that are in dialysis, we need to uh, give them five milligrams every day. And in the case of dialysis patients, it will be after the dialysis. It is important to monitor for hematological toxicity, especially for anemia. And unfortunately, we mm, do not have data uh, in elderly patients in dialysis with the new combination. So with VRD or with DRD, that are uh, some of the combinations that we may be using uh, now. So no uh, information on efficacy with RD in newly diagnosed non-transplant eligible patients requiring dialysis because those patients were not included in the first trial, but there were some patients with severe renal impairment, so with creatinine clearance less than 30 milliliters per minute. And in these severe uh, renal impaired patients, uh, no significant improvement uh, in overall response rate of PFS were uh, demonstrated uh, against MPT. So these Data uh, uh, needs to be taken, in, I mean, uh, carefully because of the numbers. So there were very few patients, and so we need to, to take this into account. So what about daratumumab? So we don't have any data with daratumumab in patients requiring dialysis or with severe uh, renal impairment uh, disease frontline. So we have some data, not too much, in relapsed refractory patients. So it appears to be safe, even in dialysis-dependent patients, and no dose modifications are needed. It can be used after dialysis, maintaining the same dilution volume and the same uh, infusion rates as in a patient with a normal kidney function. Uh, so we have this uh, retrospective multicenter Spanish study that included only 15 patients, all in dialysis, 14 patients with a cast nephropathy uh, disease and one patient that was in dialysis for other reasons not related to the myeloma. So these were, as I mentioned to you before, relapsed refractory patients with a median number of three prior lines. And in this population, overall response rate and median PFS and OS was comparable to that of the general uh, relapsed refractory population. So going back to our clinical case, so despite the patient at the beginning achieved a BGPR with a VCD, so cyclophosphamide was added in the second uh, cycle, uh, the patient progressed very early uh, and uh, we decided to start second line treatment with KRD uh, with the appropriate dose modifications for lenalidomide. Uh, the tolerance was good patient initially responded and achieved a partial response, but progressed uh, on the fourth cycle. And then we decided to start treatment with daratumumab pondex. And with that treatment, the patient is ongoing now uh, with a good tolerance. And as I mentioned to you before, the patient is, is still requiring dialysis that is performed two times per week. So just to conclude, so these are my take-home message. So renal impairment in myeloma patients can have a multifactorial origin, and this is important. A cast nephropathy is the most common form of renal injury, and sometimes it may lead to acute kidney failure. 
if this is the case or if there is acute renal insufficiency, this is a myeloma emergency and we need to do the diagnosis quickly and to start the anti-myeloma therapy as early as possible because this is critical for survival and renal recovery. So, of course, we need to uh, put in place supportive care that should include fluid resuscitation, management of other conditions that may also impact renal function, such as hypercalcemia, for example, avoid nephrotoxic drugs, and uh, for those patients that require, so start dialysis using regular filters. Uh, so as I mentioned, the use of high output dialysis membrane is controversial and no formal um, indication can be done today. Regarding antimyeloma therapy, so bortezomib-based regimens remains uh, the cornerstone of the managing, management of myeloma-related renal impairment. So it can be used safely in renal impaired patients, even in those that require dialysis. Uh, using the same dose and the same schedule uh, combined with hydrodex and ideally using also a third drug uh, because this improves uh, the results of the therapy. Lenalidomide can also be used, is also effective and safe, uh, but those adjustments are required. Teratumumab is safe in patients with end-stage renal disease or dialysis. We do not have data about efficacy in frontline patients, uh, and we don't have data uh, for end-stage renal patients uh, uh, with the new frontline combinations such as DVMP or DRD. However, it could be used in combinations with bortezomib or even with bortezomib and cyclophosphamide. Uh, to uh, increase the efficacy, and especially, I would say, to increase this rapid reduction in the free light chain production that is very important for renal recovery. Uh, and just the last one, so further improvement is indeed needed in this patient population to improve general outcomes and especially also renal recovery rates. And with this, uh, I close, uh, again, uh, wishing that all of you are in good health, and I thank you all for your attention. Hello, um, I'm uh, Mayor Bixart, and I would like to thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in this uh, first virtual meeting of COMI. And I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Mohti, for, uh, for giving me this chance. The topic I'm going to address you is how to manage myeloma patients during a pandemic, which certainly is a very hot topic. And it certainly is a moving uh, uh, platform as well, and things are highly dynamic. So by the time this uh, Congress is broadcasted, maybe things have already changed, but nevertheless, we will try our best on to the 2nd of April where this uh, recording is done. So what I'm uh, going to be talking about is uh, based on mostly the uh, experiences uh, from our center for worldwide uh, and um, mainly experiences coming from the epicenters of the uh, uh, pandemic. And um, the usual uh, approach that uh, we uh, build our recommendations on concrete evidence is not uh, the real life today. So uh, things are moving fast and we are attending webinars every day and new information is coming in. So based on these, I would like to focus on uh, five uh, subtype uh, topics and incidence of COVID-19 among myeloma or other plasma cell disorders is the first one. And I will try to approach to, to the, uh, the myeloma pre patients uh, uh, treatment and follow up during this pandemic and uh, specify the the COVID-19 uh, issue in a given myeloma patient uh, and uh, the position of clinical trials and uh, the uh, small uh, part will be on the future. Uh, 
So incidence about um, COVID-19 among myeloma patients is a big interest and uh, societies including uh, IMS, uh, EBM, EHA, ASH are now doing their best to recruit the data on these. During the last webinars I have attended, I came to notice that just uh, in New York from two main uh, uh, centers such as Mount Sinai or Memorial Sloan Kettering, well, both together have about to 50 to 60 uh, myeloma patients who uh, happen to develop COVID-19 infection. And so the, the data uh, which is uh, coming up uh, is uh, very few of them are already published. And the first case we uh, all know and have read maybe and even memorized now already uh, is a uh, myeloma and amyloidosis uh, uh, co-diagnosed in one patient and it has a long history. And um, during uh, tel teledomite maintenance therapy, the patient developed COVID-19 and the pneumonia, which was successfully treated with tocolizumab, which is a, a drug which is very familiar to uh, hematologists. Again, from China, uh, we uh, during the uh, webinars in April by uh, organized by EHA, our Chinese colleagues reported the, the incidence of their uh, hematological cases. And uh, among those, there were only five myeloma, and four of those survived uh, the treatment that was given. Uh, uh, which consisted of uh, hydroxychloroquine and an anti antiviral combination therapy. And uh, the, uh, the first positivity uh, developed about 10 days after the uh, contact, the um, uh, exposure. And uh, after this first positive test, uh, uh, it took uh, two weeks uh, for a negative test to appear. And this patient was given during this period uh, steroids uh, 20 milligram for four days, and um, and uh, and uh, the plant radiotherapy was also uh, continued during the course of the treatment, which I think is a is a unique experience. And uh, later in another webinar from our again Chinese colleagues, they summarized uh, their hematological disorder frequencies, and they still kept these plasma cell myeloma. Five uh, patients, and, uh, and uh, they, uh, their paper is going to be published soon in Leukemia. Uh, Ash Research Collaborative effort has uh, collected uh, so far uh, very few cases, and this is an update from yesterday. And there are six uh, myeloma uh, patients uh, reported, and uh, all. Overall, among the hematological uh, cancers, uh, the uh, mortality rate looks like to be around 50%. Uh, IMS International Myeloma Society is uh, from, again, another webinar yesterday, Nikhil Nusha that, uh, reported that they have already collected more than 100 patients and uh, the numbers are growing fast. And so from Europe, Italy, Spain, and France and uh, other parts of the world, including China, they are recruiting data. So this is an evolving topic and we uh, certainly are looking forward to it. So how to uh, how to handle myeloma patients uh, when uh, there is a, a widespread and very contagious virus uh, uh, around us? So, um, well, the first issue is, are myeloma patients more susceptible to viral infections? Everybody would say yes, um, but how do we uh, dissect into it? And um, all, among all, um, uh, we came to notice that um, elderly patients, uh, which is the typical myeloma population, and male and African Americans are both prone to myeloma and also COVID-19. So um, this makes it an important uh, observation that we need to take into account. Uh, other issues listed here, they are also very important. And two more issues that I would like to uh, direct, uh, to attack your uh, attention to is the cytopenias. More than neutropenia, lymphocytopenia is something to be very careful about, and immunoparesis. And this includes patients 
who are maybe at a smoldering myeloma stage that we need to be careful about, and history of thrombosis. We came to notice that I will later allude to it, uh, that uh, COVID-19 is also a prothrombotic disease, uh, just like uh, myeloma and the drugs that we are administering to myeloma patients. So these are all issues that we, that the myeloma patients should be, and the myeloma treating patients should be careful about. And uh, there are now general uh, the principles uh, that uh, is uh, including all uh, hematological patients that uh, one of them and the first one is like in the society, so like social isolation, uh, reducing visits to hospital has become uh, very important and mandatory, uh, if only mandatory face-to-face -face visits should be allowed. No accompanying caregivers are uh, uh, allowed, and there are some centers who have uh, extended the, uh, the, uh, the service given to patients, such as including blood samples or even a swab testing, uh, not at the hospital, but in, in the outpatient uh, environments. And so this has brought up the telemedicine a new platform of very high popularity, but telemedicine is not just phone calls or video calls. There is a lot of uh, professionalism behind it. Uh, it can be done real time or as a, a stored and recorded uh, that allows patients to reach the, their physicians just as if it's like a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting or uh, with the help of an assistant, a research nurse or a nurse uh, that it may even include uh, physical uh, exam uh, applications. So this is something that we need to uh, develop uh, worldwide uh, to uh, decrease the, the, the dissemination of viruses and infections. And going back to the recommendations, which are based on mostly experience and uh, is limited, of course, by the local uh, availabilities and restrictions. And uh, the, the societies mainly, such as transplant societies, EBM, the ASTTCT, or myeloma societies, or International Myeloma Foundation through webinars and uh, educational activities, have uh, published um, uh, in uh, in uh, overall uh, adaptations uh, that should be uh, adhered, uh, which of course includes the general uh, patient. Uh, related uh, factors. And uh, of those, um, some centers have developed uh, some measures, which uh, of course is, uh, if it's applicable, such as uh, um, not to ask patients to come into the clinics uh, if they have uh, infections and uh, go to the uh, appropriate zones uh, for, uh, for having uh, the tests taken. And, uh, and of course, if such occurs, they must act uh, proactively and not delay any diagnosis. And um, in some centers, there is the, the policy of to screen all uh, myeloma or hematological cancer patients, and um, such as Germany follows, is following this uh, trend, but uh, shortage of uh, diagnostic kits certainly uh, not a, a positive uh, 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 message to give uh, once it's not applicable. So, and uh, uh, which uh, which is another issue is about the, the the screening prior to chemo or advanced cellular therapies is a uh, is something which is a must or if not applicable at least a 14 day quarantine prior to starting such therapy is another measure. Uh, only a few days ago, there came a paper published by the Mayer Group, which uh, goes into more detail about the treatment approaches uh, uh, in the uh, myeloma uh, setting. And uh, their paper summarizes patients uh, uh, according to the usual uh, approach, newly diagnosed uh, patients based on their transplant eligibility and furthermore on their uh, risk status 
uh, again based on the International Myeloma Working Group classification. For high-risk transplant eligible patients, KRD is their recommended treatment schedule. I, I have heard this from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group as well. So the trend to give more, uh, more effective regimens frontline so as to be able to have a, a, a decrease in the number of and the dose of drugs in the coming months. So there will be a, a higher expectation of response and to avoid refractoriness. Depending on the, uh, the myeloid reserve of the patient, the dose of carfilzomib can um, be variable. In the standard risk patients, the usual trend to choose oral medications, including in ixazomib, prevlimid, or uh, cyclophosphamide uh, is uh, a an option which is preferred by many, by the European colleagues as well. And there are included regimens, if uh, uh, reachable, is another option. So for, you know, for newly diagnosed patients, to give the right treatment without any reduction is the, the trend, and uh, it certainly uh, 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 the COVID uh, risk outweighs the, the myeloma uh, risk is the question here. So myeloma is a more uh, dangerous disease that needs to be treated. And stem cell mobilization after 40 cycle, cycles. And, and then uh, continue transplant if the patient is high risk or defer if the patient is a uh, standard risk uh, is the uh, recommended uh, approach. Here. For transplant ineligible, again, uh, preferably oral regimens and preferably once a week administration is the core of the design. And there are uh, RD, which is a very highly effective regimen, is recommended here if uh, applicable. And again, uh, uh, exosomib, revlimid, dexamethasone, or cyborg or VRD regimens, uh, depending on the, the uh, performance status of the patient, attenuated forms are also uh, recommendable. But before starting all these, uh, screening the patients for COVID-2 uh, is recommend, highly recommended. Uh, which test, either PCR or antibody, these are all issues which are uh, under development. And that one for certainly is a, is a drug uh, which reduces NK and T cells, and so infectious morbidity is a problem here. And uh, for uh, once a response is achieved in later phases, uh, intervals can be reduced, but uh, after a while, if this problem is uh, over, the viral uh, dissemination becomes less, then going back to frequent dosing and uh, for a temporary period to uh, uh, increase, uh, increase the dose and then go back to the, pre uh, the previous intervals is, a, is a, another option. But everything is uh, individualized. That is something to be uh, remembered. And about stem cell transplant, all the societies advocate defer and delay for various reasons listed here. I don't want to go into detail. And uh, during an EBMT webinar, uh, the 130 patients registered under EBMT, they summarized the clinical outcome, but something to be uh, emphasized strongly is the, uh, the mortality rate among other patients and auto patients is higher than what we usually see in the early phase. And so that this is why transplants are uh, deferred unless it's mandatory and the patient really requires it immediately. ASTCT is updating their um, recommendations, their guidelines, and it, it Detail, in detail uh, describes what should be done. And um, so this includes also not only autologous, but uh, allogenic transplant and donor issue is important. Donor issue is not only for allogenic transplant, but autologous and all uh, for chemo patients because there's a shortage of blood supply and we need to take this into account when attempting high dose therapies. 
for maintenance, uh, again, the, the, the oral drug choice, including linalidomide and ixazomib, are important. And furthermore, there is a, a skeptical approach uh, uh, about linalidomide, about the dosing. Should uh, linalidomide be low dose or high dose uh, based on its immunostimulatory effects? This is, uh, this is not uh, known yet, but uh, linalidomide may induce T and NK cell activity, which may be helpful against viruses. And uh, exosomal maintenance is certainly an appro approved approach. And so uh, after transplant or after induction, these drugs are both uh, potential treatment options. And there are also a number of patients who have been in CR for a long time and uh, they are not high risk. And uh, the question of stopping or interrupting treatment during this pandemic is, uh, is uh, a question and it should be answered individually manner. For the relapsed patients, um, the, the question of salvage stem cell transplant um, is uh, recommended for high-risk and aggressive myeloma. Otherwise, high-risk patients uh, who are, na that are naive can receive direct combos or if not triplet regimen. So these patients require treatment and they must uh, be kept on treatment without any sacrifice as long as the drug is responding. Then uh, later uh, this can be uh, discussed. For standard myeloma patients, again, the most effective uh, relapse uh, combos, including DARA, and if uh, accessible, exosomib uh, uh, are also options. And uh, regarding CAR T treatment during this pandemic, um, during a um, webinar, um, Sundar Jagannath and uh, Faro expressed their opinions and uh, experience by Jagannath, and uh, they were able to treat uh, uh, after CAR T a COVID infection successfully. But the caution is uh, if a patient uh, requires um, uh, and develops site primary release syndrome, ICUs are already occupied, and tocilizumab is uh, can be not easily accessible, and so th those are all important uh, restrictions. What happens if a patient develops uh, myeloma patient develops COVID nineteen? We should stop anti myeloma treatment. Institute the the local standard pro uh, protocol and be cautious about all these issues and return to antimyeloma treatment after two consecutive negative tests uh, and if the patient's clinical status allows is possible. Uh, simultaneous uh, treatment of both uh, the infection and myeloma treatment is not recommended. IV immunoglobulins are certainly uh, a helpful approach, and covalent plasma as well. And hypercoagulability is something which has been uh, recorded, and we must be cautious about. We now know that uh, anticoagulation for COVID-19 is now an important aspect of the treatment and for myeloma patients as well. Uh, cytokine release syndrome, which is uh, the IL-6 CRP, we, we are all accustomed to these parameters in the myeloma setting. And this recent review uh, by uh, Carl June is a very uh, good resource to uh, read. And about randomized clinical trials, there are two aspects uh, related to plasma cell disorders. Unfortunately, all new trials are now on hold, but the new, uh, the ongoing studies are uh, uh, are not problematic, except for some studies who have stopped new patient accrual. Some, I say, some are ongoing new patient accrual as well. And uh, most of the studies now have adopted their treatment schedule, for instance, IV DARA has now moved to subcutaneous DARA, and intervals are now becoming uh, longer uh, and depending on the uh, local issues. And of course, all these um, parameters should be under the control. And um, this is a slide from Germany that shows that they are ongoing trials successfully. And uh, we have good news that uh, some 
anti-myeloma drugs such as carfilzomib and Selenox are also have antiviral activity against COV-2. And so these are uh, important new trials that we are looking forward to the results. And for future, one important issue that we are all eager to have a vaccination, but uh, live vaccines are, are dangerous for myeloma patients who are under active treatment, but the, the, the future is that this will not be a viral, uh, the active viral uh, vaccine. But there is also a big uh, topic uh, for vaccination of myeloma patients and their caregivers against pneumococci influenza and even tuberculosis has appeared as an important uh, protective uh, role. Other RNA virus vaccines such as hepatitis A virus, uh, these are um, issues that we need to keep in uh, mind. And uh, the future um, is uh, blurred at the time being, but uh, we have hope uh, in, and as uh, sun in the horizon. So we should be ke keeping ourselves positive and, um, and uh, taking into account the, the influx of uh, important uh, data. And with this, I would like to conclude and thank you for this uh, in, uh, opportunity. Good morning. Uh, my name is Artur Jurczyszyn. I am a professor of uh, hematology in Jagiellonian University uh, in Poland. Uh, I focus on plasma cell dyscrasia. Thank you uh, for, uh, for inviting me for COMI. This is an uh, online meeting. Uh, my task for you is to tell you what's new in 2020 in plasma cell leukemia. Uh, and uh, I would like to start my uh, talk. This is my disclosures. And uh, uh, my task will be tell you uh, what's new in plasma cell leukemia in 2020. Uh, and I would like to divide my talk on four uh, parts. First part uh, will be diagnosis and prognosis. Later, I will tell you more about therapy of plasma cell leukemia. Uh, another point will be the latest clinical practice guidelines. And uh, last point will be the future of uh, plasma cell leukemia. Uh, but before this, uh, I would like to tell you something about uh, Polish input uh, in this uh, situation because uh, Professor Władysław Antoni Gluziński was first scientist uh, who wrote a paper about uh, plasma cell leukemia. It was more than 100 years ago. He, he was a professor in, in uh, Warsaw and also in Lwów. Uh, and uh, he wrote uh, a case report about a man, 49 years old man, the same age like me at the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, he was uh, working in Drohobycz uh, and uh, he suffered on plasma cell leukemia. Uh, it was a uh, paper uh, you see here on the slide on the right uh, and uh, he done a lot of things in polish medicine but uh, he was the first guy in the world uh, who wrote uh, a paper about plasma cell leukemia uh, so uh, i would like to tell you about diagnosis and prognosis uh, and uh, about survival in plasma cell leukemia the diagnosis criteria is uh, quite old. Uh, everybody knows that diagnosis, uh, uh, you must have plasma cell uh, leukemia uh, cells, plasma cells uh, in morphology more than 2000 or and uh, more than 20 percent in total leukocytes counts. Uh, everybody knows that uh, sometimes you have leukopenic patients, so the mm, threshold 20 percent, I don't think uh, it's uh, the best option. Uh, and uh, we can divide uh, plasma cell leukemia on uh, three part, on two parts. Uh, we have uh, it could be a diagnosis on the beginning, like it was uh, in uh, 
Gluzinski paper. Uh, it's about 60, 70 pa pa percent of patients. And also uh, you can have uh, during progression of multiple myeloma, plasma cell leukemia. This is secondary plasma cell leukemia. It's about 40 percent of cases. Uh, people from uh, Mayo Clinic, um, especially Vincent Rajkumar and uh, Shaji Kumar, uh, together with uh, Dr. Ravi, uh, wrote two years ago the paper about revised diagnostic criteria for plasma cell leukemia. This is a result of study about 100, uh, about 200 patients diagnosed uh, between uh, 2004 and 2016. Uh, and what uh, they proved? They proved that uh, probably uh, plasma cell leukemia, we should uh, tell that patient uh, has more than 5% uh, in, uh, in the blood. Uh, you can tell uh, that it should be uh, plasma cell leukemia, not 20%. Uh, but uh, it should be validated also. Uh, here you can see cytogenetic risk. Uh, the molecular basis of plasma cell leukemia is poorly known. Cytogenetics study have shown that plasma cell um, plasma cells in the plasma cell leukemia have a whole range of cytogenetic disorders, commonly considered to worsen survival prognosis. And many doctors uh, focus on this uh, situation. And I would like. Uh, to uh, mention that uh, Edeman uh, 12 years ago showed that uh, about 70% has translocation 1114. So this is uh, important because we have a drug uh, for, for such situation. Uh, and in many uh, papers uh, like Pagano, Aved Luazo, uh, Chico, uh, you can see uh, many cytogenetics um, uh, problems like complex karyotype, uh, hypodeploid forms, etc. Uh, first, we should think how to differ uh, between plasma cell leukemia and uh, myeloma. Uh, especially uh, as you see here, people with plasma cell leukemia, primary plasma cell leukemia, are a little or younger than people with myeloma. Uh, we have people uh, between 50 and 60 years old, and in myeloma, it's about 70 years old. So another point is uh, cytopenia. People with myeloma rather has no thrombocytopenia, but people with primary plasma cell leukemia, it's a lot, like uh, 50, 100 uh, percent. Also, uh, lytic lesions and extramedullary disease. This is uh, very important that uh, people with primary plasma cell leukemia uh, has extramedullary disease in liver, spleen, and sometimes in lymph nodes. And this is the, the, the most important uh, difference. Uh, and uh, very nice paper was uh, published a couple of weeks ago re regarding pathogenesis of extramedullary multiple myeloma and plasma cell leukemia. Uh, we know that uh, people with pl primarily plasma cell leukemia and extra medu me me medullary multiple myeloma are sometimes very uh, similar. Uh, on this graph, uh, you, sh you can see initiating genetic events, secondary and terminal uh, genetic events. This is very important. Very nice paper uh, published uh, Dr. Pavlin and Dr. Morgan uh, about interaction between genetic drivers and microevenement changes uh, in high-risk disease. Uh, you, sh you see here initiating event in normal cells and driver mutations increasing bulks uh, emerging uh, situation like plasma cell leukemia and extramedullary myeloma. This is decrease in tumor suppressing cells. This is very important. So the biology of plasma cell leukemia, uh, it's uh, very complicated uh, and it's different uh, than uh, when you can compare to uh, multiple myeloma. Uh, in myeloma cells uh, are strongly dependent on bone marrow in microenvironment, which regulates their proliferation and survival. In plasma, primary plasma cell leukemia, malignant plasma cells tend to egress to the peripheral blood uh, stream. So uh, in primary plasma cell leukemia, we have lower CD56 expression. This is uh, possible to migrate to extramedullary sites. In myeloma, we have higher expression of CD56. It's a paper more than uh, 20 years ago done. And the biology also is different between 
extramedullary myeloma between plasma cell leukemia and between uh, multiple myeloma. You see here uh, that primary plasma cell leukemia has more uh, in immuno immunophenotype CD20. Uh, also, uh, you can see the difference between CD56 and CD117. Uh, in CD38, uh, it's, it's very similar. Fish abnormalities, uh, it's also very common that uh, this fish abnormalities is more complex in primary plasma cell leukemia. And mu mutation of uh, P53, it's uh, also common, more common in pl primary plasma cell leukemia. Very nice paper uh, done, Leo Rasche, our friend from Heidelberg, uh, he uh, proved that uh, in many places, in uh, one uh, myeloma patients, you can find many different uh, cytogenetics situations, many different lytic um, lesions and many different uh, cytogenetics abnormalities. For example, from one point, uh, you can have a patient with uh, deletion 713P, uh, and from another point, uh, you can find hyperdeployed uh, situation. This is very interesting. It shows you that um, patients with myeloma are very heterogeneous. Uh, here you can see the staging system. Uh, this is staging system for uh, primary plasma cell leukemia and for extramedullary multiple myeloma uh, versus multiple myeloma. Uh, in multiple myeloma, this is typical uh, what uh, was published uh, in Palumbo paper uh, five years ago. Uh, this is also uh, some difference in primary plasma cell leukemia. The survival situation in primary plasma cell leukemia, it's uh, very, uh, it's, it's not uh, good for patient because it's very aggressive disease and uh, the survival is quite short. And as you see here uh, on this uh, situation, early mortality is uh, uh, very high. And this is because of, of aggressive clinical presentation on aggressive uh, disease. Uh, as on this graph, you can see the survival time in primary plasma cell leukemia and also in secondary plasma cell leukemia. So treating patients with uh, this situation is a big challenge uh, in 2020 uh, and in the past. Uh, and to be honest, uh, it's not, 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 uh, not good uh, because patients with primary plasma cell leukemia, the overall survival uh, is like... Uh, 12 or 14 months on this uh, uh, papers, as you see. And in uh, secondary plasma cell leukemia, it's like uh, three, four months. Uh, our paper, we um, done two papers uh, two years ago uh, regarding primary plasma cell leukemia and also regarding secondary plasma cell leukemia. And uh, this was a very nice retro retrospective analysis from documentation from 34 centers from four cantons. Uh, thank you uh, for our collaborators uh, for this input. In one paper published in British Journal of Hematology, uh, we uh, published 117 patients with primary plasma cell leukemia. And uh, what we done, uh, we showed that uh, over survival, uh, it's better in the than in the past. In the past, I show you in the uh, previous slides, it was like uh, 12, 14 months. In our paper, we have uh, over survival like 20, uh, three months. So this is doublet since these last decades. And also it's better in secondary plasma cell leukemia we proved that it's 4.2 months. Uh, the paper regarding secondary plasma cell leukemia was published two years ago, also in leukemia and lymphoma. We published 101 patients, uh, more than 80% diagnosed between 2011 and 2016. Uh, on these uh, papers, we have uh, important factors affecting survival. I think this will be like take home message that uh, uh, factors affecting survival is age, platelets and plasma cells in the blood. This was in the primal plasma cell leukemia. So patients live longer when it's uh, less than 60 years old. Uh, patients live longer than when platelets are le less than 100. Uh, and patients live longer than when uh, plasma cells are less than 20,000. It was in the paper 
hazard ratio is very nice, as you see here. It was in the paper regarding primary plasma cell leukemia. In secondary plasma cell leukemia, uh, the factors affecting survivors is only platelets. When patients diagnosed with secondary plasma cell leukemia has platelets more than 100, then can live more than one, years, one, one year. But in, when a patient has platelets less than 100, the prognosis is very poor because this patient over survival is like 3.5 months. And uh, I'm <clears throat> very proud of this slide because this slide is, uh, for me, it's the most important uh, in our, uh, my presentation. The prognostic index in primary plasma cell leukemia. This is independent risk factors of inferiority over survival regarding age, platelets, and plasma cells. Uh, this <clears throat> prognostic index uh, uh, should be validated, I know it, but uh, in our paper, we show that patients uh, could be assigned to one point to adverse prognostic uh, events factors. Uh, you can have uh, points from zero to three. And when you have a patient with zero points, so patient is like uh, 50 years old, platelets more than 100 uh, plasma cells less than 20,000, this patient, when he will be treated properly, can live about 46 months. But when patients uh, as are uh, older than 60 uh, years old and platelets are uh, less than 100, the situation uh, in prognosis is much worse. The median overall survival is like 20, 20, 12 months. So this is big difference. The prognostic index uh, in clinical practice in, is very important because first using the three variables of plasma cell in uh, this plasma cell index, we're able to identify a subset of patients who may particularly benefit from more intensive therapy. This is very important. Second, all three variables included the index can be easily determined at time on the diagnosis in comparison to immunophenotypes, cytogenetic abnormalities, uh, molecular basis. This is no doubt. Finally, all these observations derive from large start, uh, series of 117 patients from three continents, uh, from 34 centers, minimizing the bias of the ethnic backgrounds of the study of the subject. And now I would like to tell you about uh, my case, uh, my uh, lady, uh, 47 years old, uh, uh, primary plasma cell leukemia, uh, I diagnosed on October 2018. Uh, it was high risk patients and uh, I asked many doctors in the world the question how to treat. Uh, it was two years ago. So as you see here, the answers were uh, different. Uh, this is a blood smear of uh, this lady. Uh, she received uh, two cycles of VDTPase. Uh, she has uh, stem cell harvest uh, and tandem transplantation January 2019 and June 2019. Uh, now she's uh, in good condition in remission, uh, but the patient is young, as you see, and what's future? It was high risk. And I ask also people here on the graph, you see uh, what uh, you will do. Do allogenic transplantation, yes or no? My uh, pri uh, private opinion, yes, I will do it. But as you see here, some people are not happy about this. So the treatment, uh, another point. Uh, we can see the um, treatment uh, uh, regarding uh, data from uh, Israel and also the data from uh, Greece. In the data from Israel, um, it's a paper published two years ago. It was 39 patients treated in 11 centers uh, and uh, some patients were treated with new drugs and some patients with uh, old drugs. And when you as you see here, when you give patients image therapy uh, and uh, do uh, autologous transplantation, these people uh, live long, longer and median over survival is 35 uh, months. Uh, and uh, in this data from Israel, we have prognostic factors. This is important uh, about ECOG, uh, acid uric, image therapy, and uh, autologous transplantation. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, another point is uh, data from Greece. Uh, it was analysis um, 50 cases uh, from Greece diagnosed between 2000 and 2016. Uh, and uh, as you see here, median observation time was 11 months, uh, 40 patients uh, died, uh, patients uh, who were uh, treated with uh, proteasome inhibitors and autologous transplantation then can live longer, other situation are very poor. In prognostic factors, we have LDH and uh, we have the response, but when LDH uh, is less than uh, 300 and patient has very good partial remission that can live longer. Uh, this is this papers uh, published in Leukemia Research and uh, Blood Cancer Journal. Uh, in our paper, this is real world data. Uh, as you uh, heard um, in the past, it was the data from 34 centers uh, from four continent, three continents, and uh, it was people treated uh, tree therapy, B therapy, monotherapy, image chemotherapy. Uh, uh, transplantation. So uh, it was response depending on the time of uh, therapy. Uh, and uh, I think the uh, three drugs therapy is uh, very important and better than, than other possibilities. Uh, and also, uh, it, this is um, real world data uh, regarding secondary plasma cell leukemia. Uh, when you treat patient with upfront uh, autologous transplantation, it uh, could be a good option. This patient could live longer than other situation. So uh, the recommendation. Recommendation was done by European Myeloma Network. Uh, and uh, this is very important that general recommendation is diagnosis is similar use like malloma. Uh, it must be performed peripheral blood uh, uh, analysis uh, to analyze these plasma cells in the blood. And also it goes to do PET CT to detect uh, other possibilities uh, as you uh, uh, know, uh, as you are aware, it could be extramedullary uh, disease in liver, in spleen and lymph nodes. Uh, the effectiveness of diagnosis largely determines the time from state treatment. Start treatment should be done as soon as possible. This is very important. The best is free drugs regimen, uh, emits proteasome inhibitor, uh, it should be the basis. The intervals between treatment cycles should be uh, as short as time as possible. This is also very important not to do prolong. After induction treatment, tandem autologous transplantation should be performed, followed by consolidation and maintenance therapy, and of course, it's important supportive care like in myeloma. Allogeneic transplantation can be and could be performed in selected cases, especially when patient is less than 50 years old. This is the recommendation. First induction free four cycles. It could be VTD, VRD, PAT, uh, some situation like hyper CVAT, uh, it could be VTT pace also. Uh, and when you have eligible donor, you can uh, do uh, allogeneic transplantation. When you have eligible, ineligible donor, uh, autologous transplantation, and in future, uh, allogeneic uh, RIC. Uh, when you have no donor, uh, you do tandem transplantation and maintenance. This is the situation not eligible for transplantation. So uh, when you have patient fit or not fit, uh, patient fit uh, age less than 75 years old, free drugs therapy uh, based on bortezomib and imits. And in fragile patients, you can do uh, VD or ERD. What are doing when you have relapse uh, situation? When patient is fit, uh, you can rein do reinduction therapy schema with bortezomib, uh, uh, and uh, when you have donor eligible, of course, male ablative uh, therapy and, and allogeneic is the best option. But uh, when you have older patient, you can, uh, you can consider RIC allogeneic transplantation, uh, and of course, uh, autologous transplantation and consolidation and maintenance therapy. What future? Uh, in future, uh, you uh, you must uh, know uh, that uh, it's um, many clinical trials at the moment. 
uh, but uh, the correct diagnosis is, is very important. This is a, a trial uh, done by European Myeloma Network. It was uh, published last ash. Uh, patients uh, received induction therapy, carfizomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, later uh, mobilization and uh, autologous transplantation, consolidation, carfizomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. Uh, you can uh, think about RIC allogenic transplantation or maintenance. Uh, in uh, not eligible patient, patient receiving four cycles of uh, carfizomib, lenalidomide, uh, dexamethasone, uh, and uh, later uh, maintenance uh, uh, with uh, carfilzomib and lenalidomide. This is uh, the patient deposition. Uh, it's not uh, big data at the moment, but the results are very imp important. The response following four cycles of KRD induction for the first 15 patients uh, are very nice, as you see here. Uh, VGPR or better are 80%. So in this uh, high-risk population, this is very good results. KRD induce deep hematologic response after four cycles. Uh, toxicities consisted about 20% uh, grade three uh, and 27% grade four uh, and can be occurred mainly during the first cycle of induction and uh, was manageable with appropriate interventions. KRD provides efficient and rapid response control, which is essential to prevent early mortality because uh, or irreversible disease complication and to improve survival of patients with this aggressive plasma cell proliferative disorder. So probably this is the best option uh, in the induction therapy uh, in the world. The future. It is very interesting. Uh, I show you the graph when <clears throat> uh, you see translocation 11, 14 can be noticed uh, about 70%. So when you have patients uh, with such situation, vena, venatoclax is quite a nice uh, uh, option. It's a selective oral BCL2 inhibitor used in the treatment of CLL, of course but it could be treated, it could be uh, used in uh, in myeloma too, also with patients has translocation 1114. Uh, you see here all patients uh, and patients with translocation 1114, the results are very, very, very nice. This is a, a case report to, with patients with uh, translocation 11. Uh, 14, uh, and as you see here, a uh, patient was treated uh, some uh, drugs before, also with autologous transplantation, and venoteclax therapy, uh, it's very nice results, mere uh, more molecular, uh, and this is MRD negative uh, uh, in this in these patients. So, on the last point, I would like uh, to tell you that uh, this is my work regarding heterogeneity uh, of myeloma. Uh, we published 100 myeloma patients on uh, Polish uh, 100 anniversary. And uh, if you are interested, I can send you this book. And I would like to invite you uh, to Krakow. Uh, it will be a nine international conference. Also, we will tell about plasma cell leukemia. And I hope, I hope it will be a nice meeting in Krakow. Thank you for your.